Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining YCharts uh, for an extra special webinar today. Uh, today, we've got Beth Kindig from IO Fund joining us, and we're going to be talking about everybody's favorite FANG stocks. So I'm excited to get into a, a, a nice media agenda there. Um, before we do, though, I did want to take just a moment to introduce Beth. Most of you probably know her from her contributions on Forbes, Market Watch, Fox Business. You probably follow her on Twitter. Um, she's a CEO and lead analyst at IO Fund, uh, where you focus on almost exclusively technology stocks. Is that right, Beth? Correct. Great. And also no stranger to big moves in tech stocks. Um, you know, I, I know from following you for a while that you were famously on the right side of some big moves, including Facebook back in 2018, um, making some good calls on a few IPOs, being on the right side of uh, you know, Roku, and uh, also on the right side of Uber, which was the opposite side. So um, you know, no stranger to big moves, which we've been seeing a lot of. Um, but if you want to flip to our agenda, we can, uh, can kind of dive in. Our, our format today is going to be a um, chance for Beth to give us a, a pretty good rundown on a few different topics. Um, yeah, if you want to go one more slide. Oops. Yep. Perfect, perfect. So we'll go through a few topics, talk about growth when it's back in favor. Um, you'll give us some insights on why tech is a stock picker's um, market, and, and that's always the case, but maybe especially now. Um, see some fangs that could see all-time highs, and then uh, also hear a little bit about how you look at both technical and fundamental analysis when you're looking at these stocks, right? All right. We'll take it away, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump in with some questions at the end. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Caleb. I appreciate YCharts for hosting this, and thanks, everyone, for listening in. Um, I want to start with the question that is on everyone's mind, um, which is when will growth be back in favor? I think that that needs to be addressed before we can talk about uh, some of the changes I'm seeing in the top five world's most valuable tech companies, um, usually called FANG. Uh, obviously, Netflix is not in the top five, but that acronym stands for stock picking, uh, picking winners. FANG is representing you know, the top winners across tech. And uh, I just uh, thought we would first touch base with when will growth be back in favor before we go into the changes we're seeing in the top five and what things are most likely to see their all time highs again and which ones are less likely, uh, according to data we pull from Y charts. So uh, we will go you know, through all those different elements today. You know, the Fed being dovish always helps tech. So certainly that is absolutely true. Um, however, I, as a tech industry analyst, am much more focused on supply chains. Um, this is something that will eventually ease, but semiconductors have a very strong trickle-down effect across my whole industry. So what will happen is automotive, uh, we are tracking record inventory at the manufacturing uh, factories uh, because they don't have enough semiconductors to push the vehicles out. Um, that means automotive companies pull back on advertising, which causes ad tech stocks to crash um, across the board. If fewer people are able to sell goods, they might cut back on cloud products because they don't have as big of budgets because they're not able to sell as many goods. Uh, consumer, consumer hardware is another one that has a huge trickle down effect for my industry uh, because everything is very intricately linked. Um, not only uh, does consumer hardware drive a lot of um, budgets and advertising, um, but it touches all kinds of semiconductors, all kinds of big tech companies, and combined, even those who have very little exposure can take a big hit uh, on their stock price, even if consumer hardware is not their primary segment, it's just one of many segments. So. Uh, you can't underestimate the trickle down effect that supply chains have had. Um, this has been backed up for a very long time. Uh, we covered in China, uh, we covered in April that we were hoping supply chains to ease by Q3. We still think there will be ample improvement by Q3. The China lockdowns that recently happened may have delayed it yet again. But the truth is that uh, if you listen to auto OEMs, they're very positive. Uh, GM has a big bounce coming right now. Ford has a big bounce between Q2 and Q3. Um, those companies matter to me more than they ever have before because they're the bellwethers around these supply issues. So um, that's one thing that we look for for the return of growth stocks. 
Um, what this chart is showing you is something that I don't think people emphasize enough, which is that uh, we have had some very strong tech companies have to clear enormous hurdles for eight straight quarters because what happened, um, either one of two things happened. They were very strong out the gate during COVID, which is your Q2 2020. And that strength had to continue uh, through, and I'll show you a chart here from Y charts in just a minute. Uh, that strength continued to the point where right now we're lapping the hardest comps for many of the highest performing names. Uh, the other thing that happened is that Q2 2020, either, either you came strong out the gate so you've had to clear eight straight quarters of high comps, or you were slow out the gate and Q2 2020, which is your COVID comps, completely crashed your revenue. So your comps in Q2 2021 were so high that you now can't clear them this year. Um, the good news about this one is it's going to definitely clear for Q3 guides. So let me show you some examples. This actually shows you kind of what I'm talking about. If you look over here on the left, you'll see that... Um, Zoom was coming in really hot. It was above 300% for many quarters. Uh, it's very hard for a company to continually clear 300% quarters. Uh, but we have some others that I just pulled. This is not an endorsement necessarily of any particular stock. I just tried to pick some COVID winners. And you can see through July of 2021, uh, a few of them were above 100%. And Shopify over here was still above 100% in Q2. So if they weren't above 100% last year, this time, then they were still above 100% uh, by Q3. And that snap that I'm speaking of that ramped up um, for Q3 to be that high. So basically, uh, what I'm getting at is these comps were very, very hard for these companies to clear. We don't know what a return to normal looks like for these very, very strong companies until we get these Q3 guides that are coming up. So I'm personally very excited about that. Um, I knew a while ago that this April quarter was going to be super tough. Uh, and again, it comes from this visual of Shopify and Roblox, for example, and many others having these high watermarks. These high watermarks continued in some extent into Q3. Um, so other than Snap, we should be able to see some strong uh, Q3 guides. Uh, excuse me, even with Snap, we should be able to see some strong Q3 guides because if you look at October, things really start to settle and they start to come around to being a little bit more reasonable for these companies to clear those growth rates. Um, in a perfect world, we would see supply chains ease in Q3 uh, because this would also be when these comps start to uh, become very reasonable to clear. So those are two things that I believe will contribute to the growth market returning. The reason why it's important um, to talk about why tech is always a stock picker's market is because research within this category can be particularly rewarding. Um, and what I wanna point out is that the exception, uh, actually I'm just gonna, I'll go back in a minute. The exception here is uh, that the indexes were so incredibly strong uh, last year or two years ago. This 48% is an anomaly. And usually you're seeing a much lower average from the index fund. So people got very complacent and they felt like any tech stock that they pick was going to rally uh, because 2020, almost all tech did rally. You only had to look at the top line. And I think some people were literally sorting stocks by who is the top five in terms of revenue growth and just throwing all their money in, into that company. That's no longer going to work moving forward. Um, so we're going to return to what's basically a stock picker market. Um, and I'll get back to this in a couple points in just a minute. But when we look even at the very top, we see that it's always been a stock picker's market. Even at the top of the FANG, if we go back to January 1, 2018, there are two stocks that had 200% returns, uh, even with this massive sell-off we've had. And there are two stocks that have had less than 0% returns. Um, so I just want to pause and say that I'll go into some of the differences between these companies so that it's kind of understood why some would have such phenomenal returns, even with a massive tech sell-off, while others were very stagnant. Um, so I'll go into that in just a minute. But I do want to point out that actually in 2018, we covered Microsoft and we covered the catalyst that Microsoft um, was taking advantage of that helped it become, you know, a top performer up there with Apple. 
And we also covered why Facebook would stumble uh, in 2018. So had you subscribed actually to my free newsletter, um, you would have gotten bullish notes on Microsoft and bearish notes on Facebook, and it could have made a difference. So we are always looking to be proactive instead of reactive. And so uh, I'll go through some of the tools that we use from YCharts to be a little bit more proactive. Um, and also as part of this presentation, we'll go over brand new analysis on why we think two of the things are most likely to reach all time highs again um, in a proactive manner. So before we do that, though, I do want to just point out that uh, to be a great tech stock picker, uh, which we feel we are, we have beat all other all tech portfolios across four audit periods. So right now we've done quite well. Every year is a new year. So we uh, try to remain very competitive in that way. But at the same time, I think it's good to just acknowledge that in the past we've been pretty strong stock pickers. And uh, one thing that I have recently done a presentation on uh, for premium members is how to look for a catalyst with tech and to really understand each catalyst is probably your best bulletproof uh, piece of research that you can possibly do. Because if you happen to know a catalyst, you'll be able to hold a tech stock even through drawdowns. And that's the number one point is how do you tell the difference between Facebook 2018 and Microsoft 2018? Like, how, how do you know the difference? Um, so the catalyst in Apple's, uh, for Apple, I would argue was not the iPhone. I would argue it was the app economy. Hardware doesn't really make a moat. There are many mobile devices on the market today, but there are only two operating systems. And the reason there are only two operating systems is because developers create that constraint and they don't want to learn any more programming languages. So Microsoft attempted to uh, launch a mobile operating system and they were shut down. Uh, not because of the consumer uh, and the 4 billion people in the world today that have a smartphone, clearly there is enough of an addressable market for a new player. It's because the developers said, we're no longer going to build out apps for any other operating system. So, uh, so Apple had a defensible moat because of the app economy. So if you knew that the developers were creating such a strong eco uh, app economy and moat around Apple, that no company would be able to shake it from its defensible position, you would have been able to hold that company through the great financial crisis, for example. Um, Facebook, uh, is it a social news feed or is it highly dependent on third-party data? Um, in my opinion, the catalyst, the catalyst for Facebook is the third-party data, which is why in 2018, uh, we said this company is going to really struggle. Uh, Third-party data was bound to get cut off. Uh, if it wasn't going to be from Congress and the governments, it was going to be from Apple. And we actually covered that in 2019. Fast forward two to three years, Apple did exactly that. Uh, and so in my opinion, you know, Facebook's catalyst, which brought it to the cash efficiency that it has today may be in question. And Facebook needs to find a new answer for that particular catalyst. Microsoft, is it enterprise software? Or was it hybrid cloud? Well, uh, we had covered that it was hybrid cloud, which means that um, you're blending on-premise servers with cloud uh, deployments, that you have the best of both worlds in terms of security and protecting your IP, uh, while also leveraging the cloud. Microsoft had major inroads because of its presence in the Fortune 500 and the Global 2K, uh, where AWS was cloud only. They did not have many inroads into on-prem. So knowing that, is why we had predicted Microsoft would be a strong choice in 2018 because the hybrid market was beginning to take off. Uh, and that would create a very strong trajectory for Microsoft. Um, and then Amazon, as you know, AWS was the primary catalyst. And one thing I wanna point out here is that you would have already known Amazon's brand name back in you know, 10, 15 years ago, you would have been already ordering books. But would you have known that it you know, had cloud infrastructure as a service called AWS that's going to power every startup and every business in the world. Had you known that, you would have held firmly with both hands and not let the market shake you out of that stock. Um, we've recently covered Netflix in our free newsletter. Uh, we believe that the ad supported tier could be quite popular uh, because Netflix has over 100 million people sharing passwords right now, which is quite substantial. It's about 50%. Uh, their current 
their current subscriber base is around 200, 250 million. So nearly uh, an extra, you know, 50% increase in subscribers, uh, active accounts, I should say, with ad supported tier. That's a pretty strong catalyst. It's going to take time. So we are not owners of micro or Netflix right now, but we might be in the future because of that particular catalyst. Uh, Alphabet, uh, it's one thing to have been a search engine. Yahoo was a search engine. It was actually quite popular uh, 10, 15 years ago. The difference is that mobile created a major catalyst and Google knew that. And so they started to buy up Android. Uh, they launched Google Maps and they began to have a great UI really uh, for search engine. It was just a clean user interface. And um, they started to compile all of these data sources together and they eventually bought YouTube. So the difference between Alphabet, Google basically, and Yahoo, in my opinion, is that Google recognized mobile was a massive catalyst and they threw all of their weight into it. So I do wanna say that tech is worth the trouble because um, you know, even as, as as safe as possible index investor, you're still looking at 18% average annual drawdown since 2010. Our current average annual drawdown since 2018 across the, the major index is 24%. Um, so it's it's a an industry uh, and a sector where you need to have a minimum of three to five year time horizon. Uh, we've always said that. Uh, that's why I wanted to bring up the FANG since 2018. Uh, if you go to a financial advisor and you say, hey, I want to buy some stocks, the very first question they ask you is, when do you need the money? If you said this year, they'd say, no way, you're not going to put your money into stocks. Um, if you told them you wanted to buy tech stocks, uh, they probably wouldn't let you touch it for over three years. So I'm not a financial advisor, but I've spoken to many of them. And it's 100% understood across the board that you don't try to take money out of your stocks uh, within a year uh, or within three years, let alone one year. Um, and this is why, is because if you had held the NASDAQ 100 since 2010, you'd have returns of over 500% um, and the total return since 2018 of 85%. But you'd have to weather steep drawdowns, which probably sounds quite familiar to people today. Uh, but usually when the tech is in favor, people kind of forget what the downside looks like. Um, so the way to outperform, even with this kind of downside, is to hold for the long term. So I do want to show you as well um, that even with the current sell-off, um, another reason why tech is well worth the trouble and well worth the research is that the industry claims that the world's top five most valuable companies, even with the current sell-off, I think Exxon is getting close to Facebook where we're within about a 100 billion market cap between Exxon and Facebook right now. Um, but what I want to point out is that the Fed does control um, liquidity cycles, but I do not believe quantitative easing is why Apple is Apple or why Microsoft is Microsoft. Um, and I believe that those companies are where they're at today because of that major catalyst. And then of course they have really strong fundamentals. Um, cool, I think that's all I wanna say. Oh, I guess that the other thing I could mention on this slide is that uh, in a recent webinar for our premium members, we recently discussed names uh, that we believe will be in the top five by 2030 that are not currently in the FANG. Um, the purpose of this webinar is to talk about two specific FANGs that we think could see all time highs and that will be on this list uh, into the near into the near term and into the long term as well, uh, both. So we're looking for which companies are most strong uh, or strongest really during the sell off, which companies um, can continue to dominate over the next 10 years. And of these things, we have two in mind. OK, so without further ado, let's talk about the two things I could see new all-time highs. Um, I do want to say that anything we present is not a guarantee of performance. Um, it's an opinion, so consult with your financial advisor. The other thing I want to point out that is somewhat unique to the IO fund is that we actually combine fundamentals with technicals. Uh, and we do this because tech is so incredibly sentimental. What do I mean by that? Well, um, let's talk about, I guess, Netflix. It's down. Uh, 
on a stock very quickly. Um, let's see here. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me. Okay. I just got a little notice from zoom that my connection might be a little unstable, but, um, nobody's saying anything yet. So we combine both fundamentals and technicals because tech tech is sentimental. Um, it's true that, you know, cash is becoming more expensive. And so you could talk about Netflix's debt levels for sure. It's always been a issue with them. Uh, but also it dropped 35% off a 200,000 subscriber miss, a loss of 200,000 subscribers in the current quarter and about 2 million died of a loss next quarter. Um, but despite that, they've also discussed a path to monetizing another 100 million. So logically speaking, that's probably a bigger announcement than the, the nominal uh, attrition they're seeing. But because tech is so sentimental, uh, it dropped 35% in one day off that. So that's what I mean by sentimental uh, or sentiment uh, is what drives tech uh, under the hood. And that's why technical analysis has always really served us well on top of fundamentals. So you'll see some of that today and how we use yet Y charts for both. Um, but again, uh, consult with your financial advisor on any stocks. Oops. Um, cool. So let's talk about Alphabet. Um, Uh, let's see here with Google. Uh, the reason why uh, Google has a strong fundamental story and catalyst is because all of those changes I mentioned around Facebook's third party data, which, by the way, if you look on our YouTube, I've done an entire hour on that alone, uh, Facebook's third party data exposure. Um, but with Google, it's quite the opposite. They are one of the largest owners of first party data. They are the largest owner, I should say, of first party data Uh in the world. I mean, they own the operating system on mobile, Android, they own the browser, Chrome, they own the search engine that everyone uses. And YouTube actually has 2 billion users right now. So there's another one. Um, everywhere you go with your GPS, they're tracking. Um, so they have a lot of first party data and never before has first party data been more valuable than in the era of AI and machine learning, which is what will power all ads moving forward. It powers a percentage of ads now, but it'll be powering basically the whole ad ecosystem as we know it. And Google just happens to be in a nice position. The more that other companies become weaker off third-party data changes, the stronger Google will become. Um, so again, we deal in probabilities and um, this is one of the two things that did not make a higher low um, in the last push. Um, it's 22% above its critical support. So it needs to maintain its critical support. Um, and there basically it was one of the strongest stocks we had uh, in terms of the bullish divergence from oversold levels. So, um, and that's rare. And it typically means there's going to be a bigger bounce. Oops. So I had mentioned that Microsoft is in the lead. Um, is in the lead with hybrid uh, because of its inroads with the Fortune 500 and the Global 2K. And uh, that is true. That will continue likely. But it also has the ability to drive down costs because Microsoft owns the full cloud stack. And so as digital migration has occurred across cloud, um, the cost of those migrations has gone up basically because everyone's having to pay for so many cloud services now. Uh, that they're starting to question, is there a way to um, standardize across multiple uh, products, you know, on one user interface with one company, one umbrella. And that's where Microsoft really stands out is that it can drive down costs during a time uh, when budgets may come under pressure. Um, but just for what it's worth, we do own competing best of breed because it's not going to be a winner takes a one winner takes all. Uh, we own some companies that actually compete with Microsoft and we do own Microsoft. Um, so we own both, but we're very selective with our best of breed stocks. And so uh, the main catalyst for Microsoft though, is that driving down across driving down of costs across the whole full, across the full cloud stack. That's something that they can do that others um, are not able to do. 
Um, so again, this is a company that has shown, um, you know, the bullish divergence on the RSA, RSI, excuse me, um, is um, suggesting that an end to the selling is close. So the technical strength of Microsoft was actually quite strong. These technical charts are shared with you from Knox Ridley, the portfolio manager of IO Fund. I'm the fundamental side, but uh, he shared these for the purpose of this presentation. So um, above 280 uh, confirms um, that Microsoft's move to the upside uh, will continue. So we believe those were the two strongest um, during this sell-off and that they uh, are showing underlying strength even despite um, being down from their all-time highs, these are the two most likely to return to all-time highs, which is Google and Microsoft. Um, you know, N Knox actually approached me and said, what's going on with Netflix? Um, I was expecting to see the chart really weak. And in fact, I'm seeing it could show some strength. And so uh, that's when I started to write for the free newsletter about the ad supported tier. Uh, like I said, we do not own micro uh, Netflix right now, uh, but we believe the range of 328 to 405 is the best time to watch this stock. And um, I believe it's because of that ad supported tier. So even though the market brutal, brutally beat up Netflix the day that it announced its ad supported tier, I think we will look back and we will be able to reference that day and say, what was the market thinking? Um, but Netflix has some work to do. Uh, I would expect to see uh, the ad supported tier show up in revenue this time next year due to the seasonality of the way uh, the upfront season works. So um, above 405 and the probability is very, is much better that we will see all time highs again. And with Apple, the thing about Apple is that I do struggle to find the right catalyst for Apple moving forward. They've certainly tried. We've talked about healthcare and, you know, obviously electric vehicle coming and, AR uh, glasses and things like that. But ultimately, um, I don't know that Apple is being seen as anything other than a value stock. Um, it attracts conservative tech investors and because of its cash and on a PE ratio level, uh, it always is quite attractive valuation uh, when you look at it compared to other tech stocks. And, um, you know, as Knox has noted here above 155 and the odds are in favor that there will be new highs. Um, so critical support, the, the stock is about 14% above critical support. So all of these need to hold their critical support in order for this bullish count to be in play. Um, but those are the charts that we've um, dug up for you today where uh, we own Google and Microsoft um, because we believe they're the strongest things right now. Uh, we're eyeing Netflix because we think there could be some life in this stock around the ad supported tier, but rather than park our money for too long, we're going to wait before we uh, enter, that, enter that stock. And then Apple probably doesn't fit my risk profile. Um, I can be a little bit higher risk of a stock investor and I'm willing to take the sell-offs like we're seeing now because I feel more confident uh, in my ability to pick the right stocks for when the market does turn around. So, okay. So how do we correlate data to pick winning stocks? Well, like I said, I cover fundamentals and I cover product and around earnings. I have, an, uh, I have a cloud universe that I pull. Uh, there's, about 50, uh, there's about 60 to 70 cloud stocks, uh, for instance. And then, of course, I have an ad tech universe and et cetera. And I pull these comps before and after earnings to make sure the stocks that we own are still ranking very high compared to others. And that's probably the number one reason is to protect what we own. And then I also am looking for stocks that are surprising uh, to the upside and are ranking higher than I was expecting. Um, we've seen a couple of those in the most recent earnings season, uh, for example, where I was not expecting them to be ranking nearly as high as they are right now. Uh, we have stock screeners that I run all of the time for new names. And then I'll add them to my comp tables because I prefer to do it that way rather than have too much information and too much noise. So I go through the stock screeners, basically choose the ones that I think are interesting and I put them into comp tables and track them for a few quarters. Um, institutional ownership data is very strong on Y charts, seven day, 30 day, 60 day revisions, very strong on Y charts. 
Um, you can pull a ton of valuations, uh, all kinds of valuation metrics. Uh, you can look at increases in price. So we're that's another great way to know if you're missing out on a great stock is it's moving and you can monitor that. And we actually put that out on our Twitter handle a lot. Uh, the company handle will put some of this Y charts data out on our company handle. So um, we look at all kinds of things from fundamentals. I get to stay within one dashboard. I move very seamlessly through this product. It saves me a ton of time because I, we cover our universe is, pro, is one of the biggest tech is one of the biggest universes out there. So time is of the S our time is really critical for us. Um, again, this is given to me by Knox. Uh, this is the kinds of tools that he uses. Um, he uses relative strength as an early indicator of strength. Um, for instance, we did not play the current move in Chinese EVs, but we knew it was probably coming because uh, China Tech 1 and China Tech 2 was green and EVs was green. So uh, when those start to turn green, it's an early indicator of strength. We use it both ways. Uh, not only do we use it to determine what to enter, uh, but we will also use it to determine not to enter. Um, so if a certain you know, category is taking, uh, is on the sidelines, for example, like right now it's looking like semis are, um, and we have exposure to semis, we would probably wait to layer in more to our semis until those start turning green. Um, but like I said, this is actually one we pulled very recently that predicted the move in Chinese tech, um, Chinese electric vehicles, because electric vehicles and two China uh, sections were green and was not to play that, although we often do play these uh, just because it was too high risk for us right now, China. But that's just an example of how he uses it. Something very relevant and timely that he had just pulled uh, not too long ago. So one thing about our company is that we equal weight risk management. We are very, very uh, strong with risk management. We actually worked uh, with a robotics engineer on a hedge that we released in April. Um, and Knox actually cross references it with some of Y charts data. So um, this is an overview of macro um, and it can look at things such as inflation versus economic growth. Um, and it can tell you um, which which you know uh, which quadrant we're in at we are in at the moment, and so you can see that we've been primarily in the fifty percent hedge. Um, excuse me, let me back up. Some of this was the one hundred percent hedge. That was your November, October, December, um, January, February, March, and then um, you know some of this had moved into um, fifty percent hedge prior to that. So. Um, it just tells him where we are uh, in terms of um, how much risk management he needs to apply. Cool. So I've probably talked long enough. Um, I'd love to take some questions. And thank you very much for coming and, and hearing uh, what I have to say. All right. Thanks, Beth. Um, I don't know if you can see me yet. I think uh, someone on the back end might need to turn me back on. There we go. All right, a handful of questions for you, but but thank you so much for going through that. Really appreciate the insights. Awesome to see how you're, you and, and people on your team are using YTRS to get to some of those as well. But um, first question actually came from came from our team. So um, <clears throat> we worked on a, a white paper we published not too long ago called uh, Mega Caps, and what we really did is evaluate how much investors are invested in Fang stocks just from their core ETF and mutual fund holdings. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the question I guess is, when you think about giving people advice on buying or selling some of these really big name tech stocks, are you thinking about that outside of the fact that they probably hold these in their core portfolio? Are you thinking about diversifying against those positions? Or are you thinking that they should uh, essentially just manage their technology portfolio outside of those uh, kind of big ETFs and, and manage um, you know, what you call the stock pickers universe as a stock pickers universe? Yeah, I think like the one thing I would say is that no matter how you do it, um, you know, I actually had to do a crypto webinar before the sell off. And I was like, I need everyone to raise your hand. If you hear me, there will be a big sell off. There always is. And I won't continue this webinar until you've acknowledged that you've heard that because people won't hear that. So the truth is that you like, however you manage it, you just need to be prepared to hold for the long haul. Um, you need to be prepared to hold for three to five years. And 
Um, the reason too, that, uh, I wanted to show you the top five world's most valuable companies is that no industry is nearly as rewarding as tech. There's no other industry that even has one of those names, let alone all five. And so, and there's hundreds of more that have produced in great gains. So, um, the, the point though, and what I'm trying to say is that you can do a lot of things within your own risk profile. How, you know, do you have a separate fund? Do you keep it? you know, alongside your ETFs, things like that. But ultimately uh, you've got to understand that uh, if you're judging it by this short period here, which is seven months, maybe this sell-off, then you're doing it wrong. And we've always been really clear on that. I've always said, I I, I can't even tell you how many times I've been recorded saying um, the average drawdown for growth investors is 40%. Like I am always prepared for a 40% drawdown every year, every year. Um, I remember uh, Q3 2019, nobody talks about it. Cloud stocks were down 40% across the board. Um, And then of course, COVID 2020 came around and the rest is history on where those cloud stocks went in terms of price. So there's so many that people don't even reference them anymore. Um, But I like to reference them because who talks about Q3 2019 cloud sell-off? Everyone was talking value back then. So what I'm trying to say is that like, you can do things a lot of different ways. to try to manage risk, but there's nothing quite like understanding that long-term mindset. And in fact, the sell-off right now is probably to people's advantage. If you are looking to buy, it's always riskier to buy if there hasn't been a 40% sell-off yet this year. Obviously there has been even steeper than that. So um, I hope that helps. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, talk, talk about those sell-offs a little bit, because I think yeah. one, one question that came in and something that's been on um, you know, a lot of people's mind is, you know, with this big sell-off, if you're talking about a stock like Google having a lot of upside, does it have less upside than some of the other tech names that have been hit a lot harder during the sell-off? How, how do you weigh those those opportunities? So because we do so much research, we are more comfortable holding higher allocations in companies that are not the things. Um, and so, yes, I think that thinking is absolutely correct. Knowing that tech is always a stock picker's market, that means not every company is going to reach their all-time highs again uh, through the whole tech universe, not just Fang. We used Fang as a sample. Uh, But so as long as you're comfortable uh, really picking those stocks, that is obviously the key. And those will return uh, higher gains than Fang, probably. So there's... There's some gems out there. You just have to know which ones to find, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Like, and I, you know, I just keep going back to the fact that, uh, you know, the whole world is run by tech today. Um, so I, I do believe that, you know, like a nice, if you guys, if people want to give me great financial crisis, like com- let's, let's, let's compare things to the great financial crisis, that, that works for me. It doesn't work for me when people want to compare things to the dot-com bus. Uh, because tech just didn't have uh, a leading role of any kind back then. And uh, I would be really careful of thinking we're going to go through a dot-com bust when the whole world is run on technology. And in fact, the last presentation I did for premium was to show people that Fang came from $1.5 trillion economy of mobile. That's Apple, Google, and Facebook, $1.5 trillion. We have catalysts coming that are worth $15 trillion over the next 10 years. Uh, no, no joke. Like that is 10 X higher, uh, market and that will drive the world's most valuable companies. So that difference is something that I hold on to because, um, I don't want the market shaking me from such a great hand on my portfolio, knowing that there's a 10 X market coming. Oh, sorry. You mentioned those catalysts a few times and, and it was really interesting to hear you talk through the ones that kind of made you a holder of, of a few of those stocks over the last you know many years. You mentioned Netflix and their ad-based uh, model potentially being a catalyst for them going forward. Any other kind of emerging catalysts that you're willing to talk about and shed some light on that, that you're, you're keeping an eye on? Yeah, we really are zeroed in on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, that's a very massive market. Uh, and it's because uh, it'll increase GDP for countries. So it'll double actually GDP for the United States, many European countries, Japan. We haven't seen a technology do that yet. Uh, mobile is not even close to that uh, impact. 
And so again, if mobile gave us Apple, Google, and Facebook, and it did give us Google because the search engine traffic exploded after everyone had a operating system in their pocket. And then some of the other apps that I had mentioned, they gunned for, uh, and then 90, over 90% of Facebook's revenue is mobile. Um, so if it's able to give us three things off a 1.5 trillion market, um, imagine what the next 10 years will be. And I think those narratives get lost in the noise and the fear and that's understandable. But, um, I think that, uh, there's a big, big benefit to taking the time to understand technology as an investor. And, and Beth, you mentioned the noise and the fear, um, you know, are, are there any regulatory concerns that you have any changes that could be pushed down by regulators that could have a negative impact on some of these names or some of the other names on your list? And are you keeping a close eye on that too? Uh, you mean as far as breaking up big tech? Yeah, that or, or any type of, uh, you know, data privacy, um, uh, you know, search engine stuff, I think has been talked about in, in uh, some countries as well, breaking that up. But yeah, I think what it goes, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and that's why Google's first party data is so key compared to Facebook's third party data, because Facebook doesn't own that data. Governments can't really say like, hey, you have a relationship with a customer and I got to get in between that. That's not usually what's going on. What governments are saying is you don't have a relationship with a customer. And so we're not going to let you track them. Most people think Facebook is only tracking them when they use the social media feed, which isn't true. Prior to Apple's changes, they were tracking you across lots of different apps, many, many apps. Because they had, you know, they're tracking software everywhere. It's called Audience Network. It's a third-party ad exchange. So anyways, long story short is that Facebook collects data at time, many, very frequently when you're not using Facebook. That's against the law because you don't know what's happening. Where if Google's a collecting data while you're using the search engine, that is going to be a hard law to pass because you've created that relationship with Google. That's why Google is just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger is that they have so many um, products, at, you know, services and, and, and apps that people are willing to give their data up for. So Gmail is a great example. It's free. Google Maps, it's free. You give up your data, but you have that relationship with them. So you've opted in. So I'm less concerned about Google and much more concerned about Facebook. That makes sense. Um, you, you showed a slide that went through, uh, you know, talking about the, the big hurdles that had to be cleared to show that top line revenue growth and, and how that's looking uh, rosier in Q3. With the current kind of economic conditions, with, with the inflationary concerns that everybody, you know, is very uh, top of mind, are, are you more focused than usual on the bottom line for some of these companies where usually we're just looking at top line growth? Yes. And what I would say is that both camps are correct. One camp will tell you like, you know, tech has issues with the bottom line and it's been ignored and all people cared about was the top line valuations. And that is true. But the other camp that I also belong in is, you know, a good, a large percentage of tech companies actually have very strong bottom lines. So uh, it's not that the tech industry as a, as a whole has struggles there. The tech industry as a whole is actually quite strong there, but it's true that the younger the company, the less scale, the lower the cash, you know, the, you know, the lower the free cash flow or more negative potential negative free cash flow. And so what will happen is the private markets will push young companies off into the public markets and say, we're done, we exit, we make our money. And the public markets weren't discerning enough to say, we don't want your, you know, we don't want your, you know, your, we don't want to give you your exit. You know, like I, I actually was kind of like, just, you had mentioned Uber. I was like, Hey, don't give these VCs their exit by paying for Uber at its IPO and the company is bleeding cash and it can't get the lifetime value and customer acquisition costs to equal out. So for every $15 they spend to acquire a user, they're only making like 10 back. Um, and the VCs wanted their exit. So, you know, Uber was the darling on every news channel, but at the same time, the cash flow has no answer. There's no, there's no answer to, for that, for that company right now. Like how will you ever become profitable? So both are true. Um, I think you need to be really discerning. I think you should ask those hard questions, but at the same time, it's not like, uh, 
tech companies, you know, a good, a good half of them become profitable. A good example is like, I have a cybersecurity company that's not profitable yet. Um, but they have enough cash and uh, to become uh, free cash flow positive and they're expected to become free cash flow positive in the next one to two years. That doesn't keep me up at night at all. Uh, cybersecurity tends to um, have a really strong bottom line. Uh, we've seen that from companies like CrowdStrike and Zscaler. So that, that, that's what I mean by, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and just never buy another stock that doesn't, isn't cash flow positive because a lot of gains can be had if you can identify those that will become cash flow positive and have high growth rates. I hope that, no, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. I, I guess it, it, it definitely points to, you know, Q3 as being a, a very important earning season. Um, what about this earning season coming up here pretty soon? What are, what are you keeping an eye out for? <laughs> Well, in some regard, that's kind of behind us because the market's so forward looking that they'll look at the guide more, you know, they'll want to see what the guidance is. And Q2 was, I mean, the Q2 guides were brutal. Um, <laughs> I mean, I like this last earnings season, I, I can't even count how many headwinds tech had. And it's technically a buying opportunity because the far majority are transient and within a reasonable amount of control uh, that they'll resolve. So you had Apple's privacy changes that hammered ad tech. We had supply chain issues, which hammered lots of um, companies who needed to sell those products uh, in order to make their revenue. Um, we had the Ukraine war. Uh, we obviously had the Fed. We were, you know, the Fed was out um, as hawkish as could be there for a minute. Uh, we had high Q2 comps. I mean, it's just was like coming from all angles. I mean, at one point, there's a company where they didn't expect an ad tool to go wrong and it went wrong <laughs> and it completely blew apart their revenue guidance. Uh, so I think that the chances we have that many landmines again, anytime soon is pretty low. So I guess that's the good news is that it could be the Nadir. Uh, we could be at the Nadir just because of the sheer amount of transient headwinds we had. Uh, and I hope that. Yeah. Uh, and so the next quarter, uh, what I'm looking for is that Q3 guide. That's going to be really a big deal. Q3 guide. So is this a, a hold through this, this earnings or are you a buyer on good news, you know, right now or looking for opportunities in, in this earnings season to, to enhance positions going into Q3? Um, Yes, there are a couple of what we call momentum plays. So we really built out what we have two sections. We call one long-term buy and hold. These are highest conviction, longer term holds. And when the market's down, for the most part, we tend to add to them as long as some of those technicals, you know, are showing uh, strength. So in this case, we would have added to Google and Microsoft. If we had owned the others, we would not have added. Um, just to give you an example of the sample we already discussed, but high quality, high conviction, long-term buy and hold. The majority of those positions are built out over the recent sell-off, but we are eyeing momentum plays and momentum plays mean that we will hold for a shorter period of time uh, for companies that are showing renewed strength. Um, but we feel there are some showing renewed strength and that, Q2 is probably the bottom for fundamentals. All right. Sounds good. Um, but you mentioned that three-year holding period or that minimum you know, time that you'd want to be invested to, to really see the potential of being a, a tech investor. Talk to me a little bit about your exit strategies, though. How do you look at, at good exits? Are there any indicators that you're following from a technical standpoint? Or are you looking for just, you know, shifts in your fundamental beliefs in a company, and then you, you look to exit a position? So we do use technicals uh, to trim drastically. So if I like a company fundamentally and something is flashing, uh, red, red flags or red whatever is flashing, we will um, greatly reduce it down to a one to 2% position. Um, we are very good at not adding uh, to those with technical weakness which really saves your portfolio in the long term. You'd be surprised as to how big of a deal that is. Um, like Knox's cut Teladoc at the very top. 
Um, he's traded crypto better than most because he's checking when Bitcoin's topping out and then taking a bunch of gains and re-entering towards the bottom, keyword towards, not at. Nobody could ever find a bottom in crypto. That would be nearly impossible. Um, so that kind of things, things are always going on because it's actively managed. But from a fundamental standpoint, uh, I usually give a company maximum two quarters, uh, sometimes one quarter. And I'm always, I always know what it is I'm looking for. Uh, there's always, uh, you know, one or two things that I need that company to do in order to remain long. And it's not as simple as they need to beat on revenue. Um, okay. So as most people know, I've, I've always really liked Roku's for actually first party data standing. Uh, I call it the Royal flush positioning because they have so much first party data. Um, and they have to grow, uh, users. They have to grow their active accounts. That's more important than their margins to me. Um, because I'm okay with a company that will invest for growth, but I need to see that growth. The market will always beat up Roku over the margins, but then Roku proves we can just let, uh, like, you know, lower our spending and our profitability will return very quickly, or we can increase our spending and we'll let go of profitability for a little bit. They have that leverage. So that's less kind of a concern to me. What's more of a concern is the active account growth. So Roku, I'm always looking for that uh, when I watch their earnings, for example. Got it. Um, all right. I, th I think we've got time for a couple more here. Uh, one, one question that came up a lot, and I know you mentioned how, uh, you know, a few times, uh, you know, tech loves a dovish Fed. We certainly don't have a dovish Fed. Um, but you also mentioned that um, there are several other things that tend to be a little bit more important to tech other than the interest rate environment. How are you watching the Fed, though, and, and looking at their decisions and their, their policy right now and, and thinking about that when it comes to your tech positions? Yeah. So I would say my team is kind of like a football team where everybody has their specialty and Knox, the portfolio manager, he actually does one hour webinars every week. And I'd say 20 minutes minimum is broad market. Uh, and so he's really the right person to discuss how he changes his positioning around fed policy. But I would also say that the hedge that we designed uh, was really we've thought about this from all angles. I've seen people who quote unquote specialize in tech randomly start running to commodities and randomly start running to energy and things like that. That doesn't make any sense to us because tech is so incredibly specialized and it's so important that you find those winners because it's a stock picker industry. Um, you should absolutely always be completely 100% laser focused on tech. Um, and that should never change. So we know that like hundred percent confidence that that's how tech should be handled. So what we did instead is we worked on a hedge, one where you don't get whipsawed very often. And one that uses, um, you know, uh, like I said, we leveraged a robotics engineer for automation around the hedge. Um, and we think that is a much more powerful way to remain invested in tech while weathering any kind of economic backdrop um, is that you hedge almost the full amount of your up to up to the full amount of your portfolio. I think we're hedged about 50% of our portfolio value right now. Um, and these are all done through stock alerts. So that is how we prefer risk management in the face of a more hawkish Fed. Got it. And that's the, the four quadrants that we saw that you showed on that last slide and kind of put us somewhere in the middle of the 50 to 100% hedge area right now. That right? Interpreting that. Yeah, right? I mean, exactly. I mean, let's like go back in time. Let's say it's like, you know, uh, I mean, how are you like, let's say 10, 15 years ago, you could pick an Apple and a Google, maybe you had some not so great ones. Maybe you had Yahoo or something in there too, even though I think Yahoo had a moment for itself. Um, like, let's say you have a tech portfolio and you've got great winners in there. Like, are, are you really going to sell them and try to get back in? That's nearly impossible to do. Um, so the whole idea is that you hold those winners and you hedge rather than try to sell and re-enter. It makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, but the last question that I was hoping you could answer for everybody, we've had a few questions around how to subscribe to your newsletter and if you could give just a little bit more information on, on IO Fund in general. So 
So I mean, you could take a couple minutes to do that and then we can kind of wrap things up here. Yeah, thanks. So um, if you go to iofund.com, there's a button at the bottom that says subscribe to a free newsletter. And I think Emma might be putting it in the Q&A for you too. Um, and so if you go to the io-fund.com at the bottom, it says subscribe to our free newsletter, click here, you would click there. Uh, I have been covering tech since 2011 uh, in Silicon Valley, and I started to present at large tech conferences such as Black Hat, Android Developers Conference, very technical conferences basically on the value of products. I was a developer evangelist, which is kind of a second or somewhere around the CEO in terms of how many speaking opportunities you have on what products do, where they fit in competitively. And um, what that meant is that I've probably written on tech more than anybody really I want to say in the world. And I mean that because I say that because I wrote, uh, between 20, between 2011 and 2013, I wrote probably 800 articles on tech and tech products. Um, I then started to write 50 page white papers, um, that were used for large, uh, partnerships, B2B partnerships, which are quite large investments. If you think it's hard to pick a tech stock, uh, that you can just exit if you've made the wrong decision, try picking a vendor like in the cybersecurity market where the whole um, success of your company is dependent on it. So those are the kinds of things white papers are used for. They help get teams together to move forward with those vendor selections. And uh, so then I started to write for the public markets and I did that through a free newsletter. I very consistently put it out every week. It's in-depth analysis that we give away for free because we think it's uh, nice to be part of the community and to provide things to the community. Uh, and every week we do a deep dive uh, around where our thoughts are. We covered the supply chain in Q3. Like I said, I used it as a sample, but back in 2018, we covered Microsoft's hybrid cloud strategy and Facebook's third-party data issues. Uh, we put that out every week and, um, yeah, we have over 35, I think we have about 35,000 subscribers to it now. Uh, funds, large institutions uh, subscribe, things like that. And that newsletter has allowed us to have very strong media partnerships. We're the only site that I know of outside of institutions that get the level of press, tier one press that we get. Uh, I'm frequently on Fox Business News uh, almost every month I'm on Fox Business News. Uh, I've been on Bloomberg in the past, NPR in the past, Yahoo Finance in the past, TD Ameritrade. I'm sure I'm forgetting some Coindesk on some of the crypto things. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think that that's helpful to know because not very many people get past those media gatekeepers. But uh, the newsletter has helped us do that. So it's a free newsletter and we hope that you will check it out. And the IO Fund is an actively managed portfolio of 20 positions. Like I said, we're a football team. Everyone has their specialty We've been audited a couple times. Uh, we beat ARC in 2020, their great year, their banner year. We beat ARC in 2021 by a long shot. We were over 40% higher than ARC uh, in 2021. We had positive 11% returns during the year when most people were negative. Um, but investing is a marathon. Um, so no past performance is a guarantee of future performance. But I think it does help to say like, hey, we aren't, we, you know, we, we do a pretty good job. So yeah, yeah indeed. that's the key point. Well, Beth, thank you so much for joining. Um, I know I learned a ton today. I'm sure everybody that was able to join us this afternoon also learned a ton. Um, anybody that is looking forward to watching this again, we will send the recording out to everybody. Um, but you know, Beth, if we're uh, lucky enough to have you back, we'd love to. And uh, certainly we'll, we'll keep an eye on, uh, you know, your Twitter and your newsletter for some good insights going forward. So thank you so much and, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Take care.